The Garden of Eden has been one of the, the most influential stories within the Bible. From, from poetry to, to art to, to movies and, and dramas, every generation has seemed to be interested and intrigued by this story, the story of Adam and Eve. Now, maybe it's the talking serpent that draws us in. And after all, that is a little bit fun and wild to imagine a talking animal. But the story that we read today is incredibly powerful. It's a story about temptation, about love and life and death. As you heard, Adam and Eve are within the garden. They are in paradise. And God has given them all sorts of trees that they can eat from. And life is perfect. But then, one day, they come upon that one tree. And it's the only tree that God has told them not to eat from. And the serpent tempts them. They eat the apple, and their eyes are open to the realities of the world. For the first time, they are afraid and feel ashamed. They try to hide, and then we know that they are punished and banned from the garden, and so their paradise is lost. Now today, I want to talk about the temptation that Adam and Eve are faced with. I think what we'll see is that the, the temptation that they experience is actually similar to temptations that we might experience too. But before we look at the, the actual temptation and the fall of Adam and Eve, I want to take some time to say a few things about Eve. Eve is often the ones that Christians have blamed. For centuries, Christians have said that Eve is the one who was tempted in the story. And she was the one who listened to the serpent. And therefore, Eve, and, and more broadly, all women are to blame for sin and getting humans kicked out of paradise. Now, you might be thinking, now, oh, Paul, that sounds ridiculous. How on earth could someone read this story and then blame all women? And I couldn't agree more. Sounds a little ridiculous, doesn't it? But unfortunately, a quick Google search will reveal countless articles and sermons by Christians who continue to preach this nonsense. I think as Christians, we should be vehemently opposed to any sort of reading like that. Blaming Eve for sin and the fall from paradise has led to all sorts of, of challenges for women in the real world. And continues to influence our society's desire to control women. But even outside of the societal implications of this particular bad reading, the reality is that blaming Eve for the temptation is not biblically correct. Check out what verse 6 says. It reads, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was the desire to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Now, did you all hear that? She gave some to her husband, who was with her. Now, when we think about this story, we often imagine that, imagine that Eve was sort of off by herself, being tempted by the serpent. And then, after she is tempted, she goes and tempts Adam. But the scripture says that Adam was with her. Adam was with Eve the entire time. And not once does he say, hey, Eve, I'm not sure if this is a good idea. Adam doesn't say, Eve, you know, I saw some better looking fruit on a tree in another part of the garden. Let's, let's go check that fruit out. Adam doesn't say to the serpent, get out of here with your foolishness. Scram, you no good for nothing, snake. Adam doesn't say, Eve... You might eat from this tree, but I'm good. That's, that's all you. You can do it if you want to, but this isn't for me. Now we see in this scripture that Adam is right there with Eve, fully aware of what is happening, fully complicit in this act of eating. He's sucked in and tempted by the serpent too. 
unfortunately, the, the centuries and centuries of patriarchal interpretations don't want you to know that. Because as we've seen throughout the history of Christianity, it is oftentimes just easier to blame women. And so Eve often takes the blame. Now, there are, are other things in the story that people have argued over. Many people have argued over what type of fruit it is that Adam and Eve eat. The, the sort of traditional interpretation or explanation is that it's an apple. Uh, but others have said it's an, a, a pomegranate. The text simply says fruit, so we are just left to, to wonder about it. And still others have wondered why God would even plant such a tree in the garden, which I do think is a really good question for us to ask, right? It's sort of like what Catherine was talking about, right? If you, if you tell a, a toddler not to touch the cookie jar, and then you place the cookie jar right in front of them, as a parent myself, I know 100% of the time, Elias is going to reach out and touch that cookie jar. But for me, the, the specifics of this story are, are less important than the overall lessons that we derive from it. You see, Adam and Eve are tempted, just as many of us are, by different desires. And though the, the tree is called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, I think the, the tree and the fruit upon it represents their thirst and hunger for power and control. Their desire to play God themselves. Adam and Eve are tempted to eat from this tree because they believe it's going to make them like God. And their desire to become like God is not in some sort of devotional type way. They aren't trying to emulate the, the goodness or the love of God. No, their own temptation reveals their thirst for power. The thirst for, for gaining what they need so that they are self-sufficient and do not have to rely upon God. Right? If they won't die and they gain all of the knowledge of the world, then in their minds, what will they need God for? It's as if they will become their own gods. And so Adam and Eve are tempted and eat from this fruit just as many of us do too. We may not have a serpent breathing down our neck and tempting us with fruit. But the truth is our culture tempts us with the illusion of power and control. Our culture whispers to us the lie that we are self-sufficient and we don't need God. Our culture dangles different fruits from different trees right in front of our face. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is just one type. But there is also the tree of selfishness. The tree that makes me think it's all about me. The tree of individualism and greed. The tree that makes us want to be in control and exercise our power over others. The tree of personal success and influence. The tree of excess and waste. The tree of anger and hatred. The tree of arrogance and ignorance. The tree that makes us see the world with rigid binaries and think it's a world that's black and white. The tree of, you all can fill in the blanks too. There are countless other trees and each of us has to navigate the different trees that are planted in the garden of our life. Each of us has a different apple that is dangling right in front of us. And like Adam and Eve, we are tempted to eat from these other trees to garner power for ourselves, to try and become our own gods where we think we are self-sufficient and need only ourselves for our own salvation. I do think it's important to know that it's not just us on individual levels who are tempted by the fruit that are on these different trees. Right? We also see that, that communities, governments, states, and nations are tempted to eat from these trees, too. When communities pass anti-LGBTQ plus bills, they are eating from the tree of hatred and ignorance. When governments seek to restrict access to health care, they are eating from the tree of power and control. 
when people living in poverty and hunger are continually ignored, our communities are eating from the tree of self-interest and greed. When countries raise up armies and go to war, they are eating from the tree of domination, violence, and death. There are so many trees in our lives. So many apples that are dangling right in front of us, tempting us. And all too often, like Adam and Eve, we reach out and submit ourselves to that temptation. And then we go from tree to tree, eating different apples, thinking that what we, these other trees have to offer are what we need in life. We think that the fruit on these trees is, is what will give us purpose and meaning. But the reality is, is the fruit on those trees leaves us unsatisfied. Because each of those trees leads us down paths of suffering and death. When we bite into the apples that are dangling from those trees, we see that they are rotten. That they are spoiled. That the, the promises we thought they provided were all an illusion. Adam and Eve were the first to eat from the wrong tree, but the truth is, we are doing it today in so many ways. Now, there are, of course, bad trees with fruits that we need to avoid, but the gospel teaches us that there's another tree that should be firmly planted in our lives. In the Garden of Eden, it's the tree of life. God tells Adam and Eve they can eat from it as long as they like, for it is good and nourishing. It's all they need. And for us, we understand as Christians that the tree of life is none other than Christ. God has given us this beautiful tree to eat from, to receive our strength from, to live by. It's the tree that has the sweetest fruit. As apples of love, sacrifice, grace, peace, justice, mercy, and forgiveness. It's a tree that has fruits of compassion, generosity, service, and hospitality. The tree of life has our real nourishment. It has what sustains us and allows us to experience the beauty of life. And though our culture will tell you otherwise, there is no other tree that we need. My friends, if we are not eating from the tree that God gives us, the tree of Christ, well, then we are just eating from the wrong tree. So today I ask you, what tree are you eating from? What is the, the fruit that you find yourself craving? Is it from the, the tree of Christ or is it maybe from another tree? Here in just a second, you're going to be invited to, to come forward and come to our prayer station and take an apple off the tree or uh, from the, the table around it. And in this prayer station, we want you to envision that this tree here is the tree of Christ that God has given us. And so as you take a, a piece of fruit or two from it, you'll see that each apple has a different word on it. And once you get back to your seat, you can spend some time reflecting on that word and how you can better incorporate it into your life. But these are the, are the fruits that Christ gives us. And the more that we eat from Christ's tree, the fuller life, the more abundant life we will all experience. My friends, as our story shows us, Adam and Eve are tempted and their time in God's beautiful garden comes to an end. But the good news is it doesn't have to be that way for you or for me. Christ's tree is available for all. God promises to plant it in the garden of our life. And when we gather around Christ's tree, we will notice that the, the roots are deep, that the branches are wide and strong and the fruit on it, well, it's the sweetest fruit that we'll ever taste. Amen.